In our previous video lectures, we talk about equivalence classes and its transversal. So for this lecture, we are going to apply all of this in a specific equivalence relation and that will be the module in equivalence relation. So before we proceed with that, let us first recall the definition of modulo n. So let us recall that two integers are said to be congruent modulo n whenever n divides a minus b. It is an exercise for you to show that the following are equivalent. A is congruent to B modulo N if and only if A and B have the same remainder when divided by N. And we can also write A equals B plus a multiple of N. We also have this result regarding modulo N. Number one, A is congruent to itself modulo N. So a quick proof, this is just the outline. So number one is saying that N divides a minus a and that is correct because n divides 0. Number 2 is saying that if n divides a minus b then n divides b minus a. That is true, right? Because a minus b and b minus a they are just negatives of each other. Number 3, we you just have to show that if n divides a minus b and n divides b minus c then n divides a minus c. So for all of this, I am just using the definition of modulo n. So in your proof, these are the only things that you have to show. For our first theorem, we have this result. Congruence modulo n is an equivalence relation on z. How do we write it mathematically? It is saying that if we define a relation we will write it like this. This is a relation defined on Z. So we have for all A, B, and Z, we say that A is congruent to B modulo N if and only if A is equal to B mod N. This is the equivalence relation. The congruence modulo N. Okay? Now, the reason why we have this lemma, what is this saying? A is congruent to A modulo N. If we write it in terms of our equivalence relation, this will now become A is equivalent to itself. Number two is saying if A is equivalent to B, then B is equivalent to a. And number three, this will now become if A is congruent to B and B is congruent to C, then A is congruent to C modulo N. And what are these? This will be the reflexive property, symmetric property, and transitivity property of this relation. So therefore, that only proves that congruence modulo n is indeed an equivalence relation on Z. Since congruence modulo n is an equivalence relation, we can now talk about its equivalence class. Recall from our previous video lecture that if you have an equivalence relation, then you can always talk about its equivalence classes. You cannot talk about equivalence class if you do not have an equivalence relation in the first place. So for this particular equivalence relation, what we have is congruence modulo n and we denote its equivalence classes to be this one. So we have like a superscript n. So for instance, what are the equivalence classes in Z under congruence modulo 4? Previously, we just wrote it as in this way, correct? The set of equivalence class containing 0. But we want to talk about congruence modulo n. So I will now have the superscript here. But in this case, our n is 
4. So we have 0, 4. What are the elements of 0, 4? All the integers that are, so we want, let me just write it, all A in Z such that A is congruent to 0 mod 4. Correct? And it is of what form? This is of the form 4K where k is an integer, right? And what would be the equivalence class containing 1? All the integers such that it is equivalent to 1 mod 4. And therefore, it is of what form? It is of the form 4k plus 1. And so on. But if we collect that as a set... What is the set of equivalence classes? It will be the equivalence class containing 0, 1, 2, and 3. Right? This one should be 4. And let us recall that this will now make a partition of Z. Right? Okay, now in general, if we look at the congruence modulo n, the set of equivalence classes will always run from 0, 1 up to n minus 1. That result can be obtained from this lemma. Because if we are dividing by an integer n, the remainders will only be 0, 1 up to n minus 1. Take note, we are assuming here that n is positive. How does each of this equivalence class look like? Each of this is just equal to this representative plus a multiple of n. So for instance, if we go back to our example, look at this. The congruence class containing 1, so this is your a, we have 1 plus a multiple of 4. This is the equivalence class containing 0, so it's 0 plus a multiple of 4. So we define the collection of all equivalence classes to be Zn. So this is the set of equivalence classes of Z modulo n. Now for brevity, we usually write this one as a bar. So in this case, we are sure what our n is. So therefore, if we have z4, the elements will be 0, 1, 2, and 3. And take note that these are equivalence classes. They are also sets. So if we have z2, what are the only elements of z2? We just have 0 and 1. Here are more results regarding congruence modulo n. If a is congruent to b and c is congruent to d modulo n, what is this saying? If we add the two sides here, this will be the same as this one and this. So it's just the same as in equality, right? And if we have, we multiply this two, it should be the same as this two, the two right-hand sides. And if A is congruent to B and we raise A to K, it should be congruent to B raised to K. Again, it is a good exercise to prove this. What will be the application of this? What is this result saying? This one is saying that whatever we do in equality, in equations, it is also true whenever we have congruence modulo n. This will be very useful in making computations modulo n, as we can see in the next example. So suppose we want to find the remainder when 2 to the 500 is divided by n. So here we have powers of 2. So we will make use of this result, the third one. Let us first look at some powers of 2. So of course, 2 is congruent to 2 modulo 7. What about 2 squared? This is congruent to 4 mod 7. 
What about 2 cubed? That is already 8. But 8 is what? Congruent to modulo 7. Remember, we only want the remainder when it is divided by 7. Correct? And therefore, the only remainders would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. It has to be 1 less your n. 2 cubed is 8. And 8 is the remainder when divided by 7 is 1. Correct? So if you look at this, 6, 7, 8, 9. In the world modulo 7, it's like this is still 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But 7 will become 0 and then 1. So it's like a clock. It will just continue. And what will we expect here when we have negative 1, negative 2? What do you think is negative 1 modulo 7? So we will come back to 6, right? And then 6, 5, 4, 3, and 2. Just to show you why that is true, if we look at, let's say, negative 1, I am showing that it is congruent to 6 modulo 7. Well, of course, using the definition, 7 divides negative 1 minus 6. But take note that for you to easily see this, we can write negative 1 as 0 minus 1. Correct? But I don't want it to be negative. So in the world of modulo 7, 0 is equivalent to 7. So we have 7 and then minus 1. That's why we get that this is 6 mod 7. Okay, so let's just have one more negative number. So for instance, I want to compute what is negative 3 mod 4. Well, I will write negative 3 as 0 minus 3 and 0 in modulo 4 is 4. Just to make it positive, 4 minus 3 mod 4. So therefore, that is 1 mod 4. Okay, so anyway, going back to this example, what we have is that 2 raised to 3 is equal to 1 mod 7. So this is what I am going to do. I will express 500 as a multiple of 3. So how do I achieve that? Well, 500, when we divide it by 3, that will be 166 times 3 plus 2. And therefore, we now have that 2 to the 500. I can express it as 2 raised to 166 times 3 plus 2. So this is 2, 166 times 3 times 2 squared using the loss of exponents. And then what I want is my 2 cubed. So I will put 2 cubed raised to 166. And therefore, I will now turn this modulo 7. So modulo 7, this will now become 1 raised to 166. It's still 2 cube is 1. You raise it to 166, it's still 1. And then times 2 squared. So therefore, this is 4 modulo 7. And therefore, the answer here is 4. Next, we want to find the remainder when we add 1 factorial plus 2 factorial up to 500 factorial. We want to divide it by 20. 1 factorial is 1. 2 factorial is 2, 3 factorial is 3 times 2, which is 6, 4 factorial is 4, 3, 2. So that's 24, but modulo 20, this is congruent to what? The remainder is 4, right? If we have 5 factorial, this is 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And you already have 20 over here. So, therefore, what is that? Modulo 20, that is already 0. So, this is now congruent to 0 mod 20. The remainder is already 0. And therefore, this is just equal to when we 
get the modular remainder 20, so it will be congruent to 1 plus 2, 3 factorial is 6, 4 factorial is modulo 20 is 4. And then for the rest, it will be 0, right? And therefore, we have 13 mod 20. And therefore, the remainder is just equal to 13. What are these operations? So take note that I am adding two equivalence classes here. They, these are not numbers, okay? These are equivalence classes. So how come we can add sets? We define the sum of these two equivalence classes to be the equivalence class containing the sum of the representatives. So similarly, we define the product of two equivalence classes to be equal to the equivalence classes of the product of the representatives. Now notice from these definitions that it seems as if the answer depends on the representative. This statement here says that the above operations are well defined. What do we mean by an operation being well defined? We say that an operation is well defined if two numbers are equal. So this one, A is the same as A prime, B is the same as B prime. Then when we perform the operation on A and B, we should get A prime and then B prime also because this is equal to this and this is equal to this. For instance, multiplication on the set of rational numbers. Recall that for a rational number, we can write it in many ways. So for example, one half, we can also write it as two fourths and we can also write one as four over four. When we add one half plus one, that is the same as two fourths plus four over four. So that is the meaning of an operation being well defined. If this is the same as this, and this is the same as this, the answer after performing the operation, they should still be the same. Let me give you an example of how this works in Zn. So for example, in Z4, let's have, let's have, let's say, plus one. So the definition says that all you have to do is to get the sum of 2 and 1. So this will be the equivalence class containing 4. To verify that our operation is really well defined, can you give me another way of writing the equivalence class containing 2 under modulo 4? What does this contain? All the elements that are of remainder 2 when divided by 4. So for instance, 6. Is it true that 6, 4 plus 1, 4. Is this still the same as this one? Now, using the definition, what is this? This is just the equivalence class containing 7. So this is 7. Is this the same as the right-hand side is 3? Are these two sets the same? How do we know whether two equivalence classes are the same? Let us recall that we had this previous result. X is equivalent to Y if and only if their equivalence classes are equal. We just have to ask ourselves, is 7 congruent to 3 modulo 4? Yes, 7 is congruent to 3 modulo 4. The remainder when 7 is divided by 4 is 3. Or you can also check that 4 divides 7 minus 3. So therefore, this is correct. Okay. Again, well-defined means that in, in the context of our equivalence classes, even if you get another representative for the equivalence classes, the answer to the sum will still be the same. I will now give a proof that our operation on Zn is well-defined. Let us look at again the 
definition of well-defined, let's write it in terms of quantifiers so that we know how we should proceed with the proof. Here, it says that this is well-defined whenever, if this is true, then this is true. Now, notice that I have variables a, a prime, b, and b prime. Whenever you have variables, it should always have quantifiers. What will be the quantifier here? It's not given explicitly, but what will be the quantifier here? The quantifier here is the universal quantifier, right? So we should actually have for any a, a prime, b, b prime element of whatever is the set that you are talking about. So here we are getting four arbitrary elements of our set and therefore in our case we are getting four arbitrary equivalence classes if a n is the same as b n and c the equivalence class of c is the same as the equivalence class of d we want to show that if i add a plus C, this should be the same as B plus D. We will make use of the following results. Star, the equivalence class containing star is, is the same as the equivalence class of heart whenever star is congruent to heart modulo N. Take note that this is just this result, but applied to modulo n. Two equivalence classes are equal if and only if the representatives are equivalent. So notice that we can write this in terms of modulo n. So this part over here would become a is congruent to b mod n and c is congruent to d mod n then a plus c is congruent to b plus d mod n but we have already seen this right this is actually this result here the first one if a is congruent to b and c is congruent to d then if we add a and C, it will be the same as B plus D. Since this is just equivalent to this one, we have already shown that this is really well defined. Let us practice the addition and multiplication of equivalence classes. So what is the equivalence class of 5 plus the equivalence class of 6? From our definition, this is 11, but let's make it simpler. What is 11? Modulo 7, that is the same as the equivalence class containing 4. What about this one? The product of the equivalence class containing 3 and 5 is just the equivalence class containing the product. So that is 15, but 15 modulo 7, what is that? It has a remainder of 1. What about this one? This is 2 times 101 plus 45. If you divide 202 by 7, you will get a remainder of 6. And what about 45? The nearest multiple of 7 is 42. So this is 3. And therefore, this is the equivalence class of 6 plus 3, which is 9. But 9 modulo 7 is 2. Remember that in Z7, we want, the, we want our answers to be all less than 7. So we are just getting the remainder. So this 2 here, it's a good exercise. I will leave it up to you to answer that. What about this one? What is 101? The nearest multiple of 11 is 99, correct? So, therefore, that is equal to 2 modulo 11. 
and then the equivalence class of 45 would be equal to 1, correct? Because 45 is equal to 44 plus 1. So when you get the equivalence class, right, 44 is just 0. So this is 1. So I have equivalence class of 4 plus 1. So that is 5. Let's look at 2 raised to 100. So just like what we did in this example, we will look at the powers of 2 first. 2 squared is 4 modulo 11. I will just write like that. And then 2 cubed, that's 8. So that's still 8 modulo 11. 2 to the 4 is 16. So modulo 11, this is 5. What about 2 to the 5th? That is 32. The closest multiple of 11 is 22. Right? So this is 10. This is 10 mod 11. Take note that I can write 10 as 11 minus 1. And why do I want that? 11, modulo 11 is already zero so we're just left with negative one so this is congruent to negative one mod 11 and i want this because it's easier now to raise this negative one raised to an exponent is either equal to one or negative one correct so therefore i will write my two to the 100 as two to the fifth raised to 20. When I get modulo 11, 2 to the fifth is just equal to negative 1 raised to 20 mod 11. That is now equal to 1 mod 11. Okay, so therefore, this is the same as the equivalence class containing 1. Now, it is a good exercise to Complete the addition and multiplication tables for Z6. For Z6, what are the only elements? We have 0, 1, 2, up to 5. So I have 0 to 5. We have 0, 2, 4. 6 is already equal to 0. Because remember, we only want our answers to be from 0 up to 5. These are the distinct equivalence classes. 2 times 4 is 8 modulo 6. That is 2. And then 2 times 5 is 10. That is 4. Next, we have 0, 3, 6 is already 0. 3 times 3 is 9, but that is congruent to 3. So you can see that it's just always 0 and 3. What about 4? So this is 0, 4. 4 times 2 is 8, so that's 2. 4 times 3 is 12, that is already 0. 4 times 4 is 16, so that is already 4. And... 4 times 5, 20, modulo 6 is 2. Lastly, we have 0, 5, 10 is 4, modulo 6. 5 times 3, 15, so that's 3. 5 times 4 is 20, so that is Two and five times five twenty five that is one, so if you look at this row here, so it that's the pattern it just repeats zero two this is always just zero three, and then here we have zero four two zero four two, so notice here that this and this these are the only two rows which contain all the elements of Z6. For our last example, is it true that for each A, 
not equal in Z6, there is some B such that A times B is equal to 1. What this is saying? What this is saying is that we are looking for the multiplicative inverse, correct? Because if we have this equivalence class, remember this is our this is another notation for an equivalence class. If I have this equivalence class, can I always find a multiplicative inverse? Let's check it for one. So we want to find the one. All we have to do is to find the ones here. 1 times 1 is equal to 1. So, great. 1 has a multiplicative inverse. But if we look at 2, when we multiply it to each of the elements here, we do not get a 1 here. Same thing with 3. We do not get a 1 here. So, even if we multiply it with all the other elements of Z6, we cannot get a product of 1. Same thing with four so the only elements in z6 which have a multiplicative inverse are one and five because these are the only two rows which have a one in them so this is saying that what is the multiplicative inverse of five in z6 the answer is five also because five times five is equal to one and of course this one the multiplicative inverse of one is one 1 times 1 is equal to 1. So the answer here is no. Take note that in quantifiers, this is for each A not equal to 0 in Z6, there exists a B in Z6 such that A times B, the equivalence class is equal to 1. There should be that one there to indicate that this is an equivalence class. So therefore, since our answer is no, how do we show that it is really no? We are saying that the negation is true. So there exists A in Z6 such that for all B bar in Z6, A times B bar is not equal to 1. So we can just take from our multiplication table, we can just take 2. Take A bar to be equal to 2. From the multiplication table in the previous slide, A bar times B bar is not equal to 1 for all B in Z6.